Now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Lou Ayers, Lionel Barrymore in an episode of the story of Dr. Kildare from April 12, 1950. The story of Dr. Kildare. Whatsoever house I enter, there will I go for the benefit of the sick. Whatsoever things I see or hear concerning the life of men, I will keep silence thereon, counting such things to be held as sacred trusts. I will exercise my art solely for the cure of my... The story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers and Lionel Barrymore. Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer brought you those famous motion pictures. Now this exciting, heartwarming series is heard on radio. In just a moment, the story of Dr. Kildare. But first, your announcer. Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers as Dr. Kildare and Lionel Barrymore as Dr. Gillespie. Blair General Hospital, one of the great citadels of American medicine. A clump of gray-white buildings planted deep in the heart of New York, the nerve center of medical progress, where great minds and skilled hands wage man's everlasting battle against death and disease. Blair General Hospital, where life begins, where life ends, where life goes on. Psst, Dr. Kildare. Hmm? Oh, oh, hello, Millie. Shh. Why the shh? What's up? Could I speak to you a moment, Dr. Kildare? Well, of course. Come in the reception room. No one will see us. Why, Millie, how clandestine of you. Dr. Kildare, my motives are completely above board. Are you sure? <laughs> What's your problem, Millie? Well, it, it's Dr. Gillespie. Now what? I think his mind is going. What? Well, he's a little past the age when he could be falling in love, isn't he? Not as long as he can open his eyes, he isn't. <laughs> Why? Well, I just happened to pass by, and I heard him calling a florist this afternoon, and I couldn't help overhearing what he was saying. Millie, you should never eavesdrop on conversations that don't concern you. I told you you were seeing too much of Nosy Parker. Whatever Dr. Gillespie was doing was none of the business of the, the nurses or the staff of Blair General. What was he doing? Yeah, well, he told the florist he wanted some sweet peas for a charming young lady. Those were his own words. Charming young lady, he said. Sweet peas. Living dangerously, isn't he? And furthermore, he told me to cancel all his afternoon appointments at the hospital because he had a very important house call to make. Now, what do you make of that? I don't know what to make of it, but the thought of Dr. Gillespie sneaking off to date a young lady completely fascinates me. I think I'll stop by his office and see what I can find out. Kilday, why are you hanging around my office? I've got some thinking to do and you're interfering with it. What are you doing this afternoon? I'm working. What I do every afternoon. Got on your best suit, haven't you? Well, what the heck business is it of yours if I have? Fresh haircut, too. I get a fresh haircut every week. Go tend to your patients and never mind me. Oh, none of my patients need me this afternoon. Thought I might persuade you to go out someplace with me. I'm busy this afternoon. Oh, professionally or uh, otherwise? Why, Jimmy Kildare, you think I am leading a double life? Oh, no, no. <laughs> 
Ah, oh, come on now. Sure you do. You know you do. <laughs> no, it's just that well, seeing you all spruced up like you are, and <laughs> seeing that glint in your eye and putting two and two together, well, <laughs> I... Uh... Well, 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 I guess you got me dead to rights, Jimmy. There's nothing for me to do but confess. There is a woman in my life. Ah. Uh, attractive? Devilishly attractive. Brunette or blonde? Redhead. Well, we are living dangerously. <laughs> Care to come along and meet her? Oh, I certainly would. Okay. Put on your best suit and get a fresh haircut and meet me downstairs. Oh, now, wait a minute. I don't do that for my own day. Ah, you don't know how to live, Jimmy. In my day, we really knew how to make a lady feel important and sought after. If you want to come with me, you'll have to do as I do. Well, it sounds pretty silly, but I'll do it. I'll meet you downstairs in an hour. Oh, good afternoon, Dr. Gillespie. Good afternoon, Miss Henderson. Uh, this is my friend, Dr. Kildare. Oh, I'm so happy to meet you, Miss Henderson. Mm. Dr. Gillespie has told me so much about Come you. Come in. Just what did Dr. Gillespie tell you about me? <coughs> well, I... well, I realize you're a little early. What did Dr. You... Gillespie tell you about me, Dr. Kildare? Well, not very much, but enough to give me the hey, idea. Is Caroline but... ready for us, Miss Henderson? Really? I'm not deaf, Dr. Gillespie. Yeah, that is the whole trouble. Yes, Carolyn's expecting you. You can go right in. This way, Jimmy. Come in. Hello, Carolyn. Why, hello, Dr. Gillespie. <laughs> Thanks for the flowers. They came a little while ago. Well, I'll be happy. Uh, sometimes I wish you were. Uh, this is my friend, Dr. Kildare. <laughs> Jimmy, this is Carolyn Shelley. Hello, Carolyn. I'm very happy to meet you. I have been telling Dr. Kildare about you and me, Carolyn. We're going to be married, you know, Dr. Kildare. <laughs> really? Yes, as soon as I'm 20. Yeah, I met Carolyn when she was born, and it was love at first sight. Well, I can certainly see why. And so, every so often, I pay a visit. What's that book you're reading, Carolyn? It's Beauty and the Beast. Oh, sort of, uh... Like uh, you and Dr. Gillespie, isn't it? Yeah, very funny. Very, very <laughs> ah. funny. Yes, yes, yes. Carolyn, how do you feel? I'm pretty good. Except I've got sort of a tummy ache. Huh? Miss Henderson said I ate too much candy yesterday. Uh -huh. hmm. You feel as if you had a temperature? Now, Carolyn, tell me if this... <laughs> that hurts, does it? <laughs> Carolyn, uh, bend your right knee. That's it. Oh, it hurts. Uh -huh. Kildare, uh, take a look at these abdominal muscles, will you? Mm-hmm. Well, you're right, Doctor. What's the matter? Oh, don't worry, Carolyn. Don't you worry. We know just what to do for it. You take a nap now, and I'll be back to see you a little later. Yes, Dr. Gillespie. Mm. You know, that's a chronic appendix. Better watch it. Let's talk to Miss Henderson. Uh, Carolyn's parents are separated. I think Miss Henderson had better call them, hey, if there's any change for the word. I'm here in the sitting room, Dr. Gillespie. What did you say about Carolyn? She has a chronic appendix. She may need an operation. Oh, nonsense. She ate too much candy yesterday, and I told her while she was doing it that this would happen. All that child needs is a good dose of castor oil. Oh, please, no castor oil. Not while she has symptoms of appendicitis. It's an old-fashioned remedy, but it's always been a good one. No, 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 Miss Henderson, no. I definitely do not want her given castor oil. And she's only to have very light foods. If the pains in her stomach continue or her temperature goes up, you call me immediately. Oh. Where's the girl's mother? She's taken a group of models up to Boston for a fashion show. Oh, I see. Well, if I don't hear from you before, I'll be back in the morning to see Carolyn again. Come on, Jimmy. Oh, uh, nice to have met you, Miss Henderson. <clears throat> yes. We'll keep a close watch on her for a day or two. It's a darn shame about her parents. Her mother is a designer. Her father's a writer. Lives in Connecticut someplace or other. The two careers just got in the way of the marriage. Mm. What's the mother's name? Doreen Shelley. 
Miss Henderson didn't look as though she had very much confidence in what you were saying. I don't know. I don't know. I think we should try and locate Mrs. Shelley ourselves, just in case. Yeah. We're ready with your call to Boston, Dr. Kildare. Thank you. Hello? Hello, is this Mrs. Shelley? Yes. Who is this? Well, this is a Dr. Kildare at Blair General Hospital in New York. Oh, yes? What is it, Dr. Kildare? Uh, this is just a routine call, Mrs. Shelley. I visited your daughter this afternoon with Dr. Gillespie. Oh. She has an upset stomach. It may not be anything, but we wanted to be sure we could reach you. Well, I think I'd better come back in the next plane. I'll be in around midnight. Uh huh. Where can we reach Mr. Shelley? Oh, well, you'll have to try the hotels in Greenwich, Connecticut. I... I, I don't know exactly where he's staying. All right, Mrs. Shelley. We were worried because both of you were out of town. I see. Well, Dr. Gillespie has always been a worrier. I'll check with you when I get in. Goodbye. Did you get it? Oh, yes. I knew if I stepped out of here for a minute, the call would come through. What'd she say? Said she'd take the next plane back. Mm. Said we could try and locate Mr. Shelley at the hotels in Greenwich. She didn't know where he was. Miss Henderson hasn't called, so I guess Carolyn hasn't changed. Mm. Hello? This is Nellie Henderson. Who is this? This is Dr. Kildare. Uh, can you come over right away, Dr. Kildare? Something's happened to Carolyn. Something's happened to Carolyn. Hello. Hello. Hmm. Hung up. Who was it? Miss Henderson, she said something happened to Carolyn. Ah, oh, you better get over right away to see the child. I'll make arrangements for an emergency operation. And I want you to operate. Well, how can I? We don't have permission from either of the parents. Well, I'll try and reach the father by telephone. You take the ambulance and get Carolyn over here. <laughs> a seizure of pains at her waist. It wasn't anywhere near her appendix. It was at her waist. I I gave her a dose of castor oil. You were specifically told not to give her castor oil. How dare you take it upon yourself to ignore doctor's orders like but that? I didn't think it was our appendix. A little while ago, she broke out in a rash and her temperature went up. Oh, here's her room. Now, I'd wring out some towels and cold water for me. Bring some ice cubes. Yes, Dr. Kildare. Hello, Carolyn. How do you feel? I can't move. I can't move. I know. Well, that's all right. Now, you just lie still and let me look at you. Where's Dr. Gillespie? Oh, he's waiting for you at the hospital. He wants you to come over there and be close by him. Now, won't that be nice? I'm afraid of the hospital. That's where people go to die. Oh, who told you that? Miss Henderson. Oh, Miss Henderson hasn't been in a hospital in recent years, or she'd know that that's where people go to live. Ah, uh, honey, in that hospital, you're going to be like a, like a fairy princess. Dr. Gillespie and I will fight each other to the death to see who's going to be your Prince Charming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sleepy. So sleepy. Here are the towels and the ice, Doctor. All right. You help me pack this ice on her side. Yes, Doctor. Yeah. There. Now, keep putting the wet towels on her head. She mustn't go to sleep. Do you understand? She no. must not go to sleep. Yes, Dr. Kildare. Now, where's the telephone? In the hall. I'll be right back. Blair General Hospital. Dr. Gillespie, please. Oh, I'll put him right on, Dr. Kildare. Hello? Oh, Dr. Gillespie, I think her appendix is ruptured. Uh, I was afraid of that. And then she has a rash. It could be scarlet fever, or it could be the results of peritonitis. I don't know. We're going to have to operate immediately. You've been able to reach the girl's father. I located this hotel, but he was out. He'll call as soon as he comes in. How about Mrs. Shelley? I left word at the airport for her to phone as soon as she lands. Well, then I'll get Carolyn right over there. And if you know any prayers, you'd better start saying them. Return to the story of Dr. Kildare in just a moment. April 12, 1950, the story of Dr. Kildare on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. 
Hi, this is Kyle Horvath with the White Pine County Tourism and Recreation Board. If you want to get away from the big cities and get back to nature this summer, give us a call at 775-289-3720 or visit us online at elynevada.net. There's so much to do and see, I can't mention it in 30 seconds, but check out our website and you'll see what Nevada is really all about. elynevada.net or follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Give us a call at 775-289-3720 or visit us online at elynevada.net. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, that sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save the typical family 500 bucks a month, and that's huge. But it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want a plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station. More of the story of Dr. Kildare, April 12th, 1950. Now we continue with the story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers as Dr. Kildare and Lionel Barrymore as Dr. Gillespie. Dr. Gillespie? Doreen, I have the papers right here for you to sign. <laughs> yes, of course. Is she... Is she all right? Well, we won't know for a while. That's right. Here, you, you sign your name right there on the bottom line. There. Oh. Did you reach Jack? Yeah, he's on his way down. Oh, it'll break Jack's heart if... If anything happens to Carolyn... Well, Kildare's the finest young surgeon I know. Carolyn's in good hands. You you heard from Jack recently? Not too recently, no. Ah, I see now. How old were you when you two got married? Well, you remember, I was 16. Ah. Jack was just past 18. Everyone said we weren't old enough, but we both were so sure, and we managed to talk our parents into letting us get married. Yeah, they're too bad. It hasn't worked out better. Well, it worked out for a while. And then Jack's stories weren't selling. I became a model and then a fashion designer. And Jack got sensitive about me paying the bills for a while. I don't see what it matters who pays the bills if two people love each other. Yeah. Jack Shelley's on his way up, Dr. Gillespie. Oh, thank you, thank you. Oh, I'm so glad. Uh, we can go up to the reception room right there. Dr. Gillespie, how is... Doreen... How's Carolyn? She's going to be operated on right away. We won't know until then. Come on. We'll go upstairs and wait. Scalpel. Sponge. Hemostat. Tie. Scalpel. Now, don't you worry. Don't worry. Carolyn couldn't be in better hands. Oh, you feel so helpless, don't you? Now, she was crying for you when she first arrived here, Jack. She seemed disturbed because you hadn't been home. She kept asking when you were coming. Things like this are rough on kids, I know. Yeah. But Doreen and I thought if we were going to separate, well, it would be easier on her now than when she's older. I was very disappointed when you two broke up. Somehow I thought you were going to make a success of your marriage. I don't think I ever saw two youngsters anymore in love. Well, we... We used to have a lot in common. We don't have anything in common anymore. You have a child in common. You have all the plans and dreams you started out with. You have a future in common. If you only had the sense to hold on to it. Lorraine doesn't need me anymore. I think she does. You're right, Dr. Gillespie. I do. Uh, well, the truth of the matter is that things haven't been working too well for me, and 
Well, I'm not going to have my wife supporting me. Bob, all the stubborn, selfish, stiff-necked attitude. Jack, I thought you had more common sense. Marriage is a partnership, isn't it? You help each other out in a partnership, don't, don't you? Are you going to make your child unhappy, and your wife unhappy, and yourself unhappy just because you're too pig-headed to accept a little help? Well, I have my pride. Ah, pride. It's a doggone expensive luxury sometimes. It is, particularly when you buy it at the expense of love. Well, I, I never thought about it like that. Well, that's the way it looks to Doreen and Carolyn, and, and to me. Doesn't it, Doreen? Oh, yes, it does. Jack. Yeah. Jack, that's exactly the way it looks to mm. us. Well, it's complete. How is, is she? all right. The operation was a success. Oh, thank you. I can't tell you that she'll live, though. We won't know that for at least three days. Three days? It'll take three days before the crisis will be over. Can we see her? Oh, she's under a sedative. You won't be able to talk to her. Oh, but if I... If I can just see you. Yeah, me too. All right, come with me. Psst, Dr. Kildare. Oh, it's you, Millie. Yeah, come in the reception room where we won't be heard. <laughs> You know, Millie, pretty soon people are going to start talking about us. Dr. Gillespie's been at it again. At what again? I heard him on the telephone ordering flowers again. This time it was carnations. Uh -huh. I couldn't hear who he was sending them to because he pushed the door shut. I almost caught my nose in it. Mm. And the conclusion of the story of Dr. Kildare from April 12, 1950 comes up next. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Wyatt Cox. You're listening to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station. Are you suffering with arthritis or osteoporosis? Do you have diabetes? Did you know that these are just two of the hundreds of diseases that have seen improvement with Dr. Wallach's incredible longevity products? You can't get them at a health food store. The only way to get them is to call us at 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Do you have heart disease, fibromyalgia, or high blood pressure? Do you have a terrible time losing weight? Dr. Wallach can help. He was a veterinarian and cured diseases in animals. He felt that he could do the same for humans, so he became a physician. Over 50 years of research and helping people like you goes into every bottle of Dr. Wallach's amazing discoveries. Do you want to feel better? Learn how to treat the cause of your problem rather than covering up the symptoms with drugs. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Are you in bad pain? You know what I mean. Your knees hurt. Your shoulder hurts. Your elbow and back are constantly killing you. And I'm sure you've tried every pain pill or cream available at the drugstore. Am I right? Well, here's something you haven't tried. Pain Magic. Pain Magic is not available at any drugstore. The only place you can get it is by calling the special toll-free number I'm about to give you. And to make things even better, call right now and find out about our buy one, get one free offer. We're so confident it'll work for you that we offer a free bottle with your purchase. No prescription required. Call now to learn how you can get pain magic and get rid of your pain. Remember, your results may vary. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. That's 800-492-8164. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of the story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers and Lionel Barrymore, April 11th, 1950. You know what I heard him ordering this morning? What? A set of Grimm's fairy tales. <gasps> he's the strangest man. Hmm. Do you think he's in his second child? Oh, I'm positive of it, Millie. Yeah, I thought as much. Well, now if you'll excuse me, I want to have a word with him about a patient of ours. Mm -hmm. I want one of those dolls that wets his pants. 
Can you send one to can't you? My doctor, Leonard Gillespie. Kill Dad, get out of here. Go on, get out. Hello, hello. No, I don't want a doll I can give a permanent to. What would I want with a doll I could give a permanent to for? Look, I want a doll that wets its pants. It's for a little girl, and anyhow, it's none of your business. Look, I don't want to make a big production out of this. I want a doll for a little girl. Do you want to send it out for me, or shall I call some store that will? One of the things I love about you is your supreme tact. Oh, go on, sit on a scalp. Does the kind that wets its pants get a permanent, too? Well, all right, I'll send out one of those. Said uh, to Dr. Leonard Gillespie at Blair General Hospital. Thank you. Goodbye. Ah, oh, sprach. It used to be that you could just call up and order a doll, but not anymore in this age of miracles and science. So what are you doing up here eavesdropping? What do you want? I just thought you might like to go up and see Carolyn with me. I would, I would. How was she? Setting up today, making wonderful recovery. Ah, oh, well, now let's go and see her. Her mother phoned a little while ago, and they're coming over, too. I'm anxious to see that family get back together again. Yeah, so am I. But that's a little out of my line. That I can't accomplish with a scalpel. Jimmy, my boy, when you've reached my age, you'll find you've accomplished something like that more times than you'd think possible. There's more kinds of heart trouble and more ways of healing it than you'd ever realize now. Come on, let's go and see the princess. Why, good afternoon, Dr. Gillespie. Good afternoon, Dr. Kildare. How are you, Carolyn? How do you feel, young woman? I feel fine. Dr. Gillespie, can a girl marry two men? In fact, once? Mm-hmm. Oh, not without getting into an awful lot of trouble, no. Oh, that's too bad. Because I thought I might marry both you and Dr. Kildare. Oh, you did, Ed. You, you think he's prettier than I am, huh? Well, I do think he's prettier, mm -hmm. but... Out of the mouths of babes. But I think you're smarter, Dr. Gillespie. Ah, out of the mouths of babes. Come in. Mommy! Daddy! Hello, darling. Well, how's my girl today? <laughs> I'm better. When can she go home, Dr. Kildare? A few days now. There. Did you hear that, Carolyn? Mm -hmm. We have a surprise for you, darling. Miss Henderson's gone for good. And Daddy's coming home to live with you and me. Oh, Daddy! Oh, I love you so. I love you so. Oh, baby. Just you wait till you see what we're going to do. Come on, kill there. Yeah. Kind of uh, gets you to see people that happy, doesn't it? Ah, nonsense. Now, don't go turning into a sentimentalist, kill there. Oh, your eyes were getting a little misty ah, in there. Fiddly dee. You look pretty close to tears to me. Full from five. Oh, your voice is all rough. I am catching a cold. You are a very inconsistent man. I'm just not a sentimentalist. That doll you ordered just arrived, Dr. Gillespie. Oh, well, take it in to Carolyn. Well, yes, Dr. Gillespie. You know, Dr. Gillespie, you're a big phony. <laughs> that is a very shrewd diagnosis, Kildare. A very shrewd diagnosis. <laughs> And now, once again, the story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers as Dr. Kildare and Lionel Barrymore as Dr. Gillespie. Dr. Kildare, do you know what Dr. Gillespie's doing now? What's he doing now? He's playing with dolls. He is? Uh-huh, he's in Carolyn's room. Go in and see for yourself. Well, I will. No way. Why? I'm the doctor on this case. What on earth are you doing? I'm feeding this doll water. Well, what does it look like I'm doing? He's trying to get the doll to work. It won't work. Yeah, these dolls are phonies. Fakes. <laughs> oh, oh, the darn thing broke. <laughs> Confounded, I'm all wet. Oh, <laughs> could be, Dr. Gillespie, could mm. be. Now let's give the doll a permanent. Yes, I'd love to see you give a doll a permanent. All right, all right. Now you've had your fun. Now leave me alone. Just as you say, Doctor. As a matter of fact, I'll promise you right here and now I won't bother you again. Until next week.
You have just heard the story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers and Lionel Barrymore. This program was written by Gene Holloway and directed by William P. Russo. Original music was composed and conducted by Walter Schumann. Supporting cast included Loreen Tuttle, B. Benaderet, Marlene Ames, and Jack Edwards. Dick Joy speaking. April 12, 1950, the story of Dr. Kildare on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. No offense, but are you a little fat when you look in the mirror? How would you like to learn the secrets to lose three to five pounds a week easily without joining the gym or going through any crazy diets? It's called Body Sculpt by Med Diet. For the last two decades, we've been helping people just like you that have pounds they want to shed. We've helped millions of people lose thousands and thousands of pounds over the years. And now it's your turn. Learn the secrets of how to lose weight with one simple phone call. You'll see an amazing difference in a matter of days. Don't believe us. We'll offer you a money-back guarantee. If you're ready to start losing weight right now, call right now to learn more about your risk-free order to Body Sculpt. Call for your risk-free offer. 800-738-5332. That's 800-738-5332. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, an episode of the soap opera Claudia, April 11th, 1948. And now, Claudia. David, what are you trying to blow? Not a thing. He wants his breakfast. Bow wow. In case you missed the point, bow wow, I do too. Rover, here, have some orange juice while I get the rest of it. Roof. Roof. <laughs> you do sound hungry. Well, I'm not so especially hungry now. I'm merely trying to store up energy for the whole week. What do you have to do this week that's going to require all this energy? I am moving. You? Mm-hmm. Me and Bluff. What about me? Are you going to leave me behind? Leave you behind? Oh, I should say not. Thank you. But you're not going to help with any of the heavy work. That's man's work. Bluff's not a man. Well, he's man's best friend, though. Oh, You are not going to lift a finger. Well, not a finger, maybe, but how many trunks, sofas, armchairs, and barrels full of china? Not one. It's all arranged. That sounds ominous. What's all arranged? You won't even notice that we're moving. It's all fixed. I did it Saturday while you were at the office. What did you do? Now, listen, the moving men are coming on Thursday and Mm -hmm. take out everything except the beds. Then on Friday morning, they'll take the beds... And everything will be in Eastbrook before we even get there. Oh, is that so? I just want you to know how efficient things can be. We're not even even going to pack anything except our clothing. That goes by express, and we packed most of it yesterday. They do everything else. Well, tell me, do they glue all the pieces back together when they get to Connecticut? They are bonded. Oh? Uh, What good is that? Oh, I thought you'd know. Well, that's what they told me over the phone when I asked them what happens if something gets broken. Who, uh, who told you that over the phone? The moving people. The carry-all moving people. The carry-all moving people. Well, that's a pretty name. Isn't it? They carry all before them, I suppose, and leave nothing in one piece. David, they leave everything exactly the way they found it. Just the way they found it. Uh, here? No, in Connecticut, silly. <laughs> but they're not finding it in Connecticut. They're finding it here. You are impossible this morning. Why don't you eat those eggs? I am eating my eggs. But before I permit people to come in here and throw my possessions around, I think I have a right to know a little bit about them. Where did you find them, anyway? In the phone book. Wasn't Mm. I smart? Mm Mm-hmm. We pick up where you leave off. That's their slogan. A fine slogan. What does it mean? It means that they come in here, and if they find a towel on the towel rack in New York. They take the same towel, they hang it on the towel rack in the bathroom at Eastbrook. Well, don't they send it to the laundry? David, I don't think you really want to have moving people. (laughs) I think you'd rather do it all yourself and complain. Oh, you're all wrong, darling. (laughs) Good. Because they're coming up this morning to deliver the barrels. What barrels? For the good china and silver. Well, thank goodness I'll be at the office. (laughs) David, if you're going in the bedroom, take Bluff with you. I want to clean off the table, and he's always getting in the way. You Come on, Bluff. Up. Let's go. The ladies have taken over. Bet you 20 cents you didn't know you had such an efficient wife. I bet you I knew it all the time. Do you really like it? Like what? Like me to be independent and efficient. Of course I like it. 
You wouldn't like me better if I were just flighty and female. <laughs> David, you didn't answer me. <gasps> the door must be the man with the barrel. All right, all right, all right, Mr. Carriol. I'm coming. Hello. Uh, do I have the pleasure of addressing Mrs. Norton? Mrs. Norton of 12C? Yes, yes, I'm Mrs. Norton. Uh, good day to you, Mrs. Norton. Good day. I'm Olson of the Carryall Movers. Hello, Mr. Olson. You brought the barrels? The barrels for the china, silver glassware, and other ends and odds, Mrs. Norton. All right, Samson, let's go. Uh, Samson is my assistant, Mrs. How'd Norton. Do? How'd you do? Strong back, but not very talkative. Now, oh. let's see where's the best place to put those barrels. Well, uh, c can't you put them in the spare room? Lucky people, a spare room. <laughs> That, Mrs. Norton, is fine for you. Fine for your friends. Excellent for your family. But for barrels, not so good. Oh. In fact, poor. Wouldn't you say so, Samson? <laughs> he agrees with me, Mrs. Norton. Did you see him nod? Well, uh, no, I, I didn't. Oh, you, you can't leave them here, Mr. Olson. We're expecting company tomorrow. We shall bend every effort to make sure that by tomorrow, the barrels are no longer in their present position. All right, Samson, take your mark. But he's picking up the lamp. Of course he is, Mrs. Norton. Samson is our lamp man. But, Mr. Olson... Into the barrel with it. Oh, Samson. How often must I tell you not to drop lamps into a barrel? Oh. Lucky you didn't break that one, Mrs. Norton. But Mr. Olson, I, I didn't think you were going to pack everything today. You were just going to leave the barrels here. Uh-uh. Easy with the crown derby, Samson. Uh, what did you say, Mrs. Norton? Excuse me. I said you, you aren't supposed to pack things today. You're not supposed to do that until Thursday. Mr. Olson, my husband's most important client is coming for dinner tomorrow. Ah, that's the boy, Samson. Take it nice and easy. But he's going right on packing. Mrs. Norton, we have our orders. If you'd like to see them, well, here they are. Ah. Where? See? Right there. Well... It doesn't say anything about packing today. My dear lady, you cannot expect to penetrate the code of the moving business. You see that little BQR next to your name? Yes, I see. Well, the B stands for barrels. The Q stands for pack immediately. The R stands for start moving out the furniture upon arrival. But the people in the office said that we... Ours not to reason why, Mrs. Norton. We merely bow in the direction of higher authority and go on about our business. Do you mean you are going to move everything out today? You see that little E next to the BQR on the orders? I'm afraid to ask what that means. Have no fear, my dear lady. Be a stout heart. The E stands for essential. We are to leave your essentials here until Friday. What are our essentials? Well, in the carry-all directive 32A, essentials are defined as bedroom furniture, three kitchen pots, and enough china for the members of the household. You are two, I believe. Four. We have a dog and a cat. I am not supposed to consider animals, Mrs. Norton, but in certain cases I manage to make myself look the other way. Well, that's very nice of you, but why does it make any difference to the moving people whether we move today or Friday? Madam... Operations Farm End, uh, that's the name we've given a move in you, it must is. be timed accurately in order that the final moves can be completed in accordance with a prearranged schedule. Uh -uh. Easy with the Lennox, Samson. We want no casualties here. I'm afraid I don't understand. But if you want to know what I think, I think it's terrible. War and moving, Mrs. Norton, are terrible things. But as we say, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. This doesn't have anything to do with omelets that I can see. Except that you're all scrambled. Look at it this way. This afternoon, we have three quarters of a truckload empty, dispatched to Stamford, Connecticut. Yes. We're reserving that three quarters of a truck for your furniture. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, one-eighth of that load will be taken off at Stamford. Wednesday, the other eighth will go to Reading. And Friday, the remainder, your remainder, Our... will be delivered on schedule in place in your house at Eastbrook, Connecticut. But they promised... At to... 0900 hours Friday... A truck will be here with one-fourth load empty, and that will take the remainder of your material directly to Eastbrook. But they promised they wouldn't move anything out of here until Friday. Well, they probably said that they would leave what you need until Friday. You'll be surprised how little you'll need. But Mr. Carrington is coming. Oh, Samson. Sometimes I think you lack respect for the finer things. Treat that Staffordshire as though it were your own, Please. Discipline and taste is an essential to efficient moving, Mrs. Norton. Mm. Claudia, who have you been talking to? Oh, excuse me. I I didn't know you had visitors. Visitors? David, we've been invaded. So I see. Say, where are you going with that china? You too? 
I have just been explaining to Mrs. Norton that she's guilty of a slight misunderstanding. Slight? David, they're going to move everything out of here today except the bedroom and three kitchen pots. And the household china. Well, now, see here, you're not supposed to be doing that. Sir, I make you the same reply I made your wife. We have our orders. All right, Samson, start on the silverware. I feel as if we were being undressed in public. You're really planning to take everything out of here today? Mr. Norton, Samson and I will have everything in the van by 1,600 hours. 1,600 hours? You sound like the Navy. You mean four o'clock. We are like the Navy. And besides, when you say we'll have everything in the van, I, I don't see you doing anything, Mr. Olson, except talk. Your assistant seems to be doing all the work. The key to efficiency is to have sufficient supervisory personnel. Without me, the whole operation would lose its balance. Mm, if you ask me, the whole operation has lost its balance already, and I'm losing mine with it. Uh-uh. Easy with those pictures, Samson. Oh! Oh, Samson, really? One would think you have no aesthetic sense at all. Well, if we want to get moved, I guess we'd better let them do it today. I thought I was so efficient. Darling, you didn't know you were fighting a civilian navy. <laughs> As Mr. Olson would probably say, there is nothing to do but strike our colors and head back to port. Then I ought to go down with my ship. All right, you win, Mr. Carryall Movers. But just be sure it gets to Eastbrook by Friday. Now, darling, you don't have to look so heartbroken. If I had done it, they'd probably never got here at all. I love you for saying so. <laughs> Let me put my arm around you, darling. While these, uh, these vandals desecrate our home. David, it's not just us. What's going to happen when Mr. Carrington comes to dinner? And when he sits down where there isn't a chair? Well, don't worry about it, darling. Maybe, maybe they'll leave us an old crate. Well, uh, three. Every crate must be accounted for. But with 7,000 restaurants in the city of New York, why do you have to entertain your friends at home? That? My dear Mr. Olson, at least, is not any of the carry-all mover's business. All right, Samson. Now, let's get that barrel out of here. A one, a two, a three. Did you hear it rattle? Then take uh, it easy, Samson. Look, it's not my intention to disrupt the natural affection between man and wife. Now, well, that's kind of you. But if you two would only step aside, we could get this container... Out into the hall. Oh, I see. You want to move that container out into the hall. Is yes, that I... correct? Yes. Well, Claudia, maybe we'd better just move over here. All right, Out of darling. the way. We'll move. Move. Did you say move? I said move. Oh, David, I don't ever want to hear that word again. <laughs> <laughs> Many of the conveniences that have developed in America we take for granted as part of our daily lives. One of these is certainly the variety store, familiarly known to you as the 5 and 10. This week, ladies, has been set aside as nationally advertised brands week in variety stores. So when you're wandering down the aisles of your favorite store today or any day this week, keep your eye out for brands with nationally advertised labels. And as you're shopping... I suggest that you pause at the familiar red cooler or soda fountain and refresh yourself with ice-cold Coca-Cola. Uh, if you have a moment, Mr. King. Why, yes, I do. What's on your mind, Mr. Olson? Why, I just thought I'd advise you, Mr. King. If ever you are in the circumstances of moving, be sure to call the carry-all movers. Remember our slogan, we pick up where you leave off. I'll remember that. Did you get David and Claudia moved all right? As per schedule. Operations farm end is underway. Well, I don't know what they're going to do tomorrow, though, when Mr. Carrington comes to visit them. Ah, Mr. King, as the poets have said, where there is a will, there is a way. And tomorrow, the Nortons will find a way. Oh, uh, excuse me, I see it's 1,400 o'clock. I shall have to bid you good day, Mr. King. <laughs> good day, Mr. Olson. As I was about to say, every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you, transcribed, with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again tomorrow at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. And remember, whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may be, when you think of refreshment, think of Coca-Cola. For Coca-Cola makes any pause, the pause that refreshes. And ice-cold Coca-Cola is everywhere. These broadcasts are adapted for radio by Manya and Roger Starr. And the entire production is supervised and directed by William Brown Maloney. 
April 11th, 1948, Claudia on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. If you miss one of our shows, you can always catch up by going to iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon, or even Facebook. Just search for Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. That's Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You can also hear the shows at our webpage, classicradio.stream. That's classicradio.stream. Please thank this radio station, support their advertisers, and tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.